Hey everybody, this is Hercules Pedix, founder, curator, docent, and gift shop employee of the Hercules Pedix Academy of Comic Book Studies. Today we're going to be looking at The One by Rick Veitch, a six-issue miniseries published by Epic Comics from 1985 to 1986. This is a wonderful story. Um, I bought these comics off the racks, I guess I was 17, and these blew my mind. Um, this is almost like, you know, an underground comic. Um, as we'll see, there's not, you know, incredible nudity or whatever, or violence, um, like an underground would have, but it's, the themes of it are very underground, and, um, that's why it blew my mind. I was, at the time, I was probably reading, uh, Daredevil, and, uh, you know, I, I, the weirdest stuff I was reading was black and white stuff, um, maybe American flag. I, uh, so this blew, this was crazy to me. And I had read, uh, Rick Veitch before this, um, his short stories in Epic Illustrated. And, but this was the first, like, big thing I ever read by Rick Veitch. And it also made me realize that Rick Veitch is one of my favorite, uh, comics creators. And he's never let me down since. I, Huge fan of Rick Veitch. Um, almost every project he's done, I've loved. Just a great storyteller, all-around comic book storyteller. Amazing stuff. So let's check this stuff out. Number one. Great cover. Great iconic cover. Parroting a laundry box, laundry detergent. Kind of pop art. I like this uh, on the side of the box. It, it says, always sort your comics before use. Caution, mind it, irritant. So it's um, just a really a good looking piece of pop art here. Of course, it's Rick Veitch's uh, beautiful art and colors. It's an interesting thing about this comic. Um, I didn't realize that he does he does everything in this comic. He uh, writes, draws, letters, colors. I can't think of any Marvel comic where a guy ever did that. Perhaps I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure this is like the only time they let one artist do everything in a comic. We start off with this little article about Marshall McLuhan Center saying the A-bomb may be good. How the fear of the A-bomb we've had since the 40s has kind of rewired our brains and almost made us evolve a little. So uh, we start off the comic uh, with this guy, Itchy. And we can already see this is like really good Veitch. I mean, he's put a lot of work into this. That face is just so, oh man, it's a lived in face. And uh, Itchy is the super mega rich Elon Musk type guy, Bill Gates type guy. And he's telling us, this is almost like um, in a reality show, uh, the little private uh, confession booths they have. That We'll see that throughout this comic. Is Each character will get a little time just uh, doing a soliloquy to the audience, you know. And he's talking about how, you know, in the beginning, I was, he was only in it for the buck. But then all these unforeseen things happened. What this guy did is he set off a conflict between the United States and Russia. Remember, this is the height of the Cold War, 1984 um, or 1985. And basically this guy who had sold all the computer systems to America and Russia, they had like, um, I don't know what they call them, like sleeper chips in them that he could activate and take over their, their uh, arsenals. So he basically uh, started this giant war between the American and Russian navies. They they had no control over the ships. He activated this uh, this sleeper uh, computer chip and just made them attack each other. So uh, the president of America and the premier of Russia are both on the on the vid phone with him, just saying, "What the fuck are you doing, you son of a bitch?" And he's like, yeah, I'm just trying to make some money, guys. It's capitalism. So basically, both of these guys are like 
yeah, we can't back down from this. We have to do something. We can't just tell the people that you took over our navies because we'll look weak. So um, Itchy basically tells these guys, he says, well, whatever you do, guys, don't, you know, start a nuclear war because that won't help anyone. And it won't help me because I'll have all this money, but I won't be able to spend it. Because what Itchy has done is invested in all of these things, bought stocks that will obviously be more expensive after something like this happens, a war between uh, America and Russia. I love this, how Itchy's like super rich, but he kind of lives in squalor. Looks like he lives in some hovel somewhere, chain smoking constantly. He likes smoking so much, he even smokes as he's going to bed. So he basically hangs up on the guys, and both the president and the premier are furious. And they're basically contemplating, you know, nuclear war. They're like uh, Mr. President Norad's awaiting launch order, or, orders. So now we meet uh, the, one of the main characters of the comic, Egypt. And... Egypt is talking about uh, just um, when the, as the war starting. You know, she's got a kid. She's a single mom. And just uh, how scared she was feeling. So now we see her. And uh, she lives in this apartment with these characters. Well, she lives with her son, of course, Larry. And Larry's scared. He's like, Mom, are they going to blow up the world? Everyone else, all of her roommates are just like watching it like it's a sports game. Um, right here we have uh, Doc. And Doc's this old hippie. And his girlfriend is named Gouda. And her, his son is this guy named Jay Hole. And she's all like, come on guys, we gotta get food, we gotta prepare. We might have to bug out any second. And we realize that uh, Egypt's not the best mom. She, uh, basically Larry, you know, she, she wasn't ready to be a mother, but decided to have Larry anyway. And as she's yelling at Larry, all of a sudden, he just falls into this daze like a trance. And everyone else does, except for J-Hole. They look out the window, everyone on the street is in this trance. And then... All of a sudden, there's this mate, like a huge yellow light. Now we see Larry in the confessional. And he's talking about, in his, you know, simple child vocabulary, how when he was in that trance, everyone was there. You know, Doc and Gouda, everyone who was part of the big sleep. That's what it's called. And all these people in the big sleep, they saw a big light and they weren't scared anymore. So now we're back in the real world here. We see this amazing Rick Veitch airbrush <laughs> burst. They think it's an atom bomb at first, but there's no shockwave, nothing happens. It's just a flash of light. But, um, you know, her son and her roommates, it looks like they're dead. They've got no pulse. So j kind of loving this. j thinking, all right, it's the end of the world. I could, you know, I'm a strong badass. I could end up on top of the heap here. It's kind of funny. There's a poster for Heartburst, Rick Veitch's graphic novel in the background. A little plug. So he's like, oh, we got to get to high ground. And he grabs Egypt. He's like, you're coming with me. You're not, I'm not letting you out of my sight. You could be the last woman on earth. kind of shows you like j a, a pretty big piece of shit. So here we see the premier of Russia, Kubalov. And he's justifying why he had to let the missiles fly. And, uh, you know, during the Cold War, it was pretty much that mutually assured destruction. And uh, 
the whole concept in warfare, in atomic warfare, is that, you know, you've got to preemptively strike and try to knock out as many of their nukes as you can before they can launch them. So he does it. Basically dooms the world. But he's like, I, I had to do it. There was no other choice. So when I read this again last night for the first time in 30 years, I thought he was like an obsessively shaving his himself with a razor, uh, electric razor. And then it took me a few pages to realize that unexpl unexplained by Rick Veitch, this guy doesn't have a voice. He has to use one of those little like uh, boxes that make makes your voice all robotic come out of your throat. But, uh, yeah, I felt pretty silly. I was like, why is this guy shaving all the time? Is it like a nervous tick? So now we see uh, J-Hole and Egypt. They're climbing up to... He figures it'll be good to be uh, at the highest building they could find, be at the top. And all of a sudden, they see a Russian cruise missile coming their way. And a big the big light happens again. Uh, now it's Doc Fenway's uh, time to uh, spe spiel. And he talks about, you know, being in the big sleep. How it was very, uh, you know, hippy-dippy awesome. And we were all together, united. Like all of us became one. Now we see that flash of light. We're back with Egypt and J-Hole. <coughs> Excuse me. And there's this being in the light this time. And he disarms the cruise missile. So the cruise missile is basically just a big hunk of metal, which still causes quite a lot of damage. Crashes into this building. Kind of eerily reminiscent of 9-11 there. That's kind of weird. So uh, they survive the crash. And then this being appears to them. It's the one. And uh, he finally says something. And he says, Mommy, why aren't you here with me, Mommy? You're not with the other, are you? And it's Larry's voice, her son, who she thought was dead. She's like, baby. And she passes out from shock. Now we see Jay Hole's point of view. And we can tell from his dialogue, he is a, just a completely amoral, horrible person. And uh, he's basically recounting what the one was saying. Like, oh, it was a bunch of stupid bullshit. Then he goes flying off. And now I've got to carry Egypt down, you know, 100 flights of stairs. So he makes it down to the, all the way to the bottom. And all of a sudden this guy shows up. And we're going to call him Snurd for, for now. And we'll find out why. But Snurd is another aspect of the one. It's almost like that superhero one and him are like two sides of a coin. So he inform he seems to know what's going on. He informs them that nobody's dead. It's the big sleep. They're only sleeping. It, the trance is so deep that they almost seem like they're dead. You know, they don't have any pulses, but it's a special kind of sleep. And he tells uh, J. Hole that they'll be back to normal before you know it. And just another example of what a piece of shit J. Hole is, is he just leaves. He doesn't even know who this guy is, but he says, hey, take her back to her house. I got stuff to do. And then he even like says something like, could be your big chance, know what I mean? So basically he's leaving Egypt in the hands of this could be a horrible personal raper or take advantage of her. He doesn't care. He just thinks it's funny. So now we see the president saying as soon as the Russians launch their missiles, ours were on automatic and launched two. Not one of them detonated. And 
Of course, the powers that be have no idea what's going on. But they did know, realize that the nuclear age had ended and now they would need new weapons, a new kind of warfare. Luckily for America, I guess for quite a while, we had been developing this thing called Project Superior, which was trying to create super soldiers. And uh, it has borne some fruit. So the president's pretty, pretty happy. So now we see a test, a testing site uh, in an army base. And there's this tank full of soldiers. They, they have no idea why they're out there. They're like, how come we're not in Russia fighting the, the commies? It's, it's war. And then a car pulls up in their range. And they're like, hold off. Maybe it's just some civilians who got lost. And so they're looking at it with their infrared or infrared green. I don't know what this is. And listening in with their listening devices. It's a, it's a couple. And they're kind of getting a little cozy at first. So these guys are like, ooh, it's kind of fun watching, snooping on them. And he gets a little fresh. And she slaps him. And she says, don't ever touch me there. For God's sakes, I'm your sister. And these guys are like, whoa, this is uh, more juicy than we thought. So then they get orders to blow up the car. And they're like, are you sure? It's just a couple of kids. And they're like, follow your orders. So they launch, uh, they shoot the car with their tank. This is a really weird panel for Rick Veitch. I, I wouldn't even know guess that was Rick Veitch if you showed me this. It almost looks like Gene Colan, doesn't it? A little? Like a more like raw Gene Colan. These faces too. A little um, just different than Rick Veitch usually draws faces. So the car totally explodes. It's obliterated. But the young couple totally get out of the car un uninjured. And they just rip the tank apart like tissue paper. And I'm pretty sure they don't show up, but I'm pretty sure they just murder those guys. So now we see Itchy again. And Itchy's talking about how, like, yeah, I'm I'm a smart guy. I planned World War Three, but I... I had no idea what this big sleep business was all about. But in the meantime, he got super rich. So his plan worked, but the big sleep was unforeseen. And also this whole uh, superhero thing, because the Americans uh, wanted the satellite cameras to see that superhero test. They wanted Russia to see it. They wanted to scare them. So now we're in Russia. Premier Kubalov is just beating the crap out of his underlings. He's just like, how come I wasn't told about these superheroes? You should have known about that. And now we're in introduced to um, Verochtka Pavlova. I really like that panel. Rick Veitch usually doesn't uh, take his time, that as much time on faces as he does on this. I think because this was his first big project, you know. And it's Marvel. So he was trying to draw more straight than normal. So Pavlova is basically, she's been in charge of the Russians version of Project Superior, which they've been developing a super soldier thing. And she basically tells them that at the end of World War II, the Russians found these scientific documents that the Nazis left behind. And, uh, because they were working on a super soldier program. And she says, let me tell you the story of Uber Mouse. And that's how the story ends. So I, I God, man, just rereading this, I love this first issue. I mean, it's so many great plot threads, so many great ideas, concepts, so many great characters. Just, I can't wait to read the next issue, even though I just read it last night. But uh, good stuff. Rick Weiss is just a consummate storyteller. Writing, drawing, he just marries them perfectly. And so here, these are amazing. 
um, The Puzz Fundles by Rick Grimes. I assume Rick Grimes, uh, well, um, I'm pretty sure they he knew Rick Veitch. They were pals. They both went to the Kubert School. And I'm pretty sure the only reason this is in this comic or any Marvel comic is because Rick Veitch probably said, hey, I'm saving a page of this comic for my buddy. He's going to be in. Because this has got to be the probably the weirdest shit that Marvel has ever published. I mean, Marvel did that underground in the 70s with the Kitchen Sink uh, comics book. This is so much weirder than anything in there that those underground guys were putting out. This guy just has this amazingly primitive, weird cartooning style. And it's kind of like ugly and gross even. Um, but I find it so appealing for some reason. It's a, uh, the art changes from panel to panel. The writing is just, even though the writing is kind of basically like gag strips of these random weird characters, just the way they talk and Everything about the stories are just freaking weird. And as you can see, the art's very odd. But I mean, it's like almost like Mutt and Jeff humor. These roommates, this guy's like stealing the guy's wallet so he can get some track money because he loves betting on the ponies. You know what I mean? It's just typical stuff like that. And then antics ensue. Hijinks ensue. But everyone's got weird freaking weird names <laughs> and they talk in this weird dialect just amazing stuff I love these I don't know I should have looked it up I don't have any I have no idea if Rick Grimes did more of these somewhere else or maybe there's just these six pages of the Puzz Fundles but there's going to be one in every issue thankfully okay now we're going to go to number two Another nice cover. I like this parody of a dollar bill. This magazine may accrue in value one comic. Gives a little shout out to the Puzz Fundles here. And we see um, th the one going into a nuclear reactor and basically making it inert. So not only has he taken out all the atom bombs in the world, he's also taken out basically all nuclear energy. Man, I just love that giant panel of the one's face. So Egypt wakes up in her own bed and Snurd is there, <laughs> that weird guy. I like Snurd, he just kind of reminds me of like Kramer from Seinfeld and I don't know, mixed with Lyle Lovett. He's just this really goony looking guy. So she wakes up and she just freaks out. She's like, ah, jumps out of bed. Gouda comes in and uh, she everyone's awake from the big sleep. And she tells Egypt what happened. I don't remember what, Gouda doesn't even remember about the war. She was asleep. And Larry runs in. And, of course, uh, Egypt, his mom, thought she, he was dead. So she's like, baby! And it's so weird. Larry runs right into Snurd's arms and hugs him. Like he's he loves him more than anyone in the world. So, like, Snurd has this weird thing where you can't help but like him. Now we see a little private time with uh, Gouda. And Gouda's kind of filling us in about, uh, yeah, Egypt's uh, not the best mom, but. So everyone thought they were going to die. So they're celebrating. And then Jay hole comes home. He's got a, a, a gunshot wound. He's bleeding out. Uh, but he's totally happy because he has half a million dollars. So during the confusion, he went off to rob a bank. And wouldn't you know it, like the one awake cop left in New York City happened to be there and shot him. But Jay shot, killed him and escaped. So this weird snared guy goes up to Jay Hole and heals him, pulls the bullet out, 
it's as if the wound uh, was never there. But then he tells them, he says, you can come out from behind your mask, other. I know you're in there. And almost like he's possessed by a demon, J-Hole changes and his voice changes. And he says, greetings, one. And uh, he says, you, you've manifested without a true awakening. The primal emotions are still deeply rooted in this race. And where fear and loathing live, so does the other. So Snurd informs him that it was the imminent threat of self-annihilation that forced him to come early. So he's just going to have to deal with the other. So, um, you know, he's ranting like a demonic madman and Snurd just puts him to sleep. When he looks over, of course, all the characters are just like, what the fuck? What is going on? Now we see Pavlova. And she kind of admits that her interest in the Soviet super soldier is a little bit more of a personal... Her interest is a personal nature, of a personal nature. So she tells them the whole story behind Ubermaus. Uh, the Nazis... This is kind of horrifying. They concocted a serum of human pineal gland excretions taken from half a million condemned inmates at Auschwitz and Dachau and then injected into a mouse. The mouse, every time it ate, it grew exponentially and it got stronger and stronger and they kept feeding him and the rat kept getting bigger and stronger and they lo lose control of the mouse, of Uber Mouse. And he escapes and basically destroys a German city. It's like a Godzilla movie. Look at him there. He's just chowing down on all these soldiers trying to stop him. He's totally impervious to any gunfire. But like luckily, he somehow slid into the North Sea and was drowned. So, of course, the Russians have duplicated this. Uh, they get, get got the pineal gland excretions from their gulags. And the premier says, bring him in, Comrade Bog. And he's this big superhero. And I guess uh, Bog's an old Russian word meaning God. We see the president again. So uh, he's talking about how um, the two super beings, Charles and Amelia, the American super beings, they wanted to do kind of psychological tests on him, like let him be alone for a while to see how they react. I think they're spying on him the whole time, but they want them to think that they're free to go and free to run around and to see what happens. So they're running through New York City and they run so fast nobody can see them. So it's not like they're still incognito. And they run to their, um, the farmhouse where they grew up. Uh, you know, their brother and sister. Uh, their parents were these super patriots. The father was a scientist. He developed the serum that turned them into super beings. And apparently Russian agents killed them when, when Charles and Amelia were young. So, you know, their whole lives they've had this like, their patriotic anti-Russian thing going on in their heads. And uh, he apologizes for his behavior in the car about, you know, how he just has feelings for her. Because both of them are kind of like, to them, normal humans just seem like monkeys, like having sex with a monkey. So they're both kind of like the, the only people they really want in the world. Because Amelia kind of admits that she's into him too, like has thoughts, you know. But they can't because they're brother and sister. So it's almost like they're condemned to a life of virginity. So they're horsing around in New York City. They, they're chasing each other around. And uh, yeah, Charles is goofing off and he backs up right into an oil truck. 
And uh, I love this, how he goes right through it and knocks the engine out of the front. That's a great touch. And then they run back to the farmhouse and they're like, oh shit, we're in trouble. I fucked up big time. But that's when Amelia kind of admits, I have feelings for you too. And it looks like they're about to get it on. But Amelia says, it's wrong. And she runs away. So the president's been watching the whole time. And he's like, damn. I have a little bit of water there. And so we see Itchy commenting once again, just like, yeah, these stupid guys, they thought they could control these superheroes. <clears throat> they weren't thinking it through. So now we're in Russia. We see uh, Pavlova is, uh, someone's knocking on her door in the middle of the night. And it's Kubalov, the premier, wanting a booty call. I guess um, they, Pavlova kind of admitted that she slept her way to the top. Because in Russia, you know, she's a brilliant woman. It doesn't matter. She's a woman. So she used her, you know, talents to get what she wanted. So she says, you can't come in. I have a guest. And he's like, a guest? I made you. You'd be nothing without me. And he, ba he um, bashes his way in. And, of course, Comrade Boggs there. She was about to get down with him. So she says, go wait in the kitchen. It's it's not your fault. I'll have a talk with this guy. So he goes in the kitchen bog and he looks at the refrigerator and he opens it up and he's salivating. Because the Russians, pretty wisely, they have him completely on a strict diet so he won't get bigger and crazier like Uber Mouse. So that's how they control him. They just give him limited calories every day. And... The premier's yelling at her. He's like, you took him out of his, you know, uh, out of his controlled environment just so you could fuck him? You know how dangerous, stupid that is? And she kind of gets really harsh. She basically says, like, I've always, I wanted to be with a superior being. One who could cleanse me of all the filthy paw prints left upon me by ugly little men like you. Like she's, she uh, brings the, brings the truth home without kid gloves. So all of a sudden they hear these eating sounds and a crash. And they run into the kitchen. Of course, the refrigerator is completely empty. And Bog just smashed through the wall. It's like a Warner Brothers cartoon. So now we're back in America. Egypt is a. Uh, telling us about the one, talking about, you know, mystical mumbo jumbo. They don't get what he's talking about. And she says that the one, um, he basically tells them there's only one solution, the human touch, and out he walks. Now we see Egypt with Larry Larry's uh, saying, hey, the one said I could fly with, he'd take me flying. Can I go out flying with the one? And, you know, she's such a, she doesn't care. She's, she's not even listening to him. She's like, sure, honey, that's nice, fine. And she's looking at all, at all of J-Hole's money. And Egypt's not the best person. I mean, that's another reason why she's a bad mother. She just wants to party and get wasted. And she kind of always falls for asshole guys. And so even though she knows Jay holds a piece of shit, she's kind of seduced by all his money. And he's like, come on, let's go out and have a good time with all his money. And she's like, hmm, that sounds fun. So she just takes off. And as she's leaving, she just says, hey, Gouda, take care of Larry. Okay, bye. And Gouda's like, motherfucker. Did this again to me. And, and then the one shows up. For Larry. Yeah, here we have another amazing Puzz Fundles. I can't even describe these things. They're so weird. I don't know why I like them so much. They're like, 
I shouldn't like this art. <laughs> I I shouldn't like the this these goofy stories. But there's something so fascinating about him. I don't think anyone he's almost like um God, I uh I can't even think of the name right now. Uh it's it's just certain artists and writers are just like Rory Hayes, for example. Um just nobody has their sensibility. They're just out there. You know, it's like outsider art, I guess they call it, right? They're like a true outsider art. You can't explain it. Jablonski, that's what I was trying to think of. Gerald Jablonski. He's another one where it's like nobody makes comics like he does. Here we have the one number three. We see Doc, Doc, uh, Uh, talking about, you know, in his hippie terms, talking about the big sleep, the cosmic connection they had. He's like, man, it was like the collective unconscious with Orgone energy and Leary and the Illuminati, the I Ching, and Castaneda's Don Juan and Tesla. <laughs> so uh, the one is flying around with Larry. They're in the Arctic. And, uh, Charles, the American superhero, is running towards Russia to attack it. And even though he's got a big job to do, he's kind of like a, you know, he's a kind of like a cop, patriotic, you know, bully. And he's like, hey, you, what are you up to? Identify yourself. And uh, the one can't speak. He talks through Larry's brain. So it's kind of funny. Larry's just saying, like, hey, are you a good guy or a bad guy? And he's just asking him little kid questions. Kind of annoying him. And uh, Charles says, who the hell is he? And Larry says, he's the one. And he's thinking in my head right now. He says that you're wrong. You didn't have any mommy and daddy. And she's not your sister. And Charles is like, what the hell is that supposed to mean? <laughs> but the one flies off. So uh, they're heading towards the North Pole. And right at the North Pole, we see Snurd and all like the magnetic field, like highly charged. It's just emanating from the North Pole. So I, this whole, I realize in this panel, I could be wrong about this whole thing about him being the one. He says something like, I'm not sure if I'm misreading this, but he says, the truth has a way of doing that to people and the truth is all you'll ever get from him. So maybe this guy's name is the truth, but I don't know. I think I'm reading too much into it, the dialogue. I'm going to keep calling him the one. But he explains to Larry how they're kind of like a double, the same, they're the same person, but different. And he takes, he takes Larry into the energy field. Now we see um, Egypt is uh, partying with J-Hole. J-Hole took all of his money and just bought tons of drugs and invited all of his scumbag friends over. And it's a bad scene, you know, bad vibes all around. Everyone's just getting wasted and just, these are all terrible people. Egypt realizes she made a mistake. She's not having fun. She's like, fuck that, I'm getting out of here. And as she's leaving, though, everyone at the party is kind of possessed by the other. They turn into the other. And they're saying, join me. Your guilt will be dissolved. Your desires fulfilled. But she runs off. So Comrade Bog, you know, has now escaped and he's going crazy. He's eating as much as he can, anything he can find, getting bigger and crazier as he does. Uh, Kubalov and some soldiers are following him closely in a helicopter and a bunch of tanks are going after him. This is like a major security risk. 
So, uh, Bog is furious because he's like, they never told me that it would hurt like this and then the hunger would never stop. And so he's, he's angry with the his superiors. And so he sees the helicopter and he's got this, I don't know, a giant mutton leg and he throws it right through the helicopter, which makes it crash. Bog confronts Kubalov. And Kubalov totally lies. It's like, ah, oh, what's Pavlova's doing? I swear to you. And it looks like he's going to totally destroy him. But Kubalov says, he says basically, think about your your patriotic duty to the socialist cause. Because this guy's been brainwashed since he was a little kid to, you know, be a, to love the socialist way of life, the communist way of life. And he says, I know you're angry, but you can take out your angry anger on a more worthy subject, the, you know, the evil capitalists in America. Look, there's a rocket ready for you to get in and you can, we'll send you right to America and you can, uh, whatever, do the right thing. And he says, yeah, you're right. I'll do it, but I'll need a witness. And he grabs Kubalov by the collar and pulls him into the missile. At the last minute, he says, let me down. That's an order. And he, of course, he drops him. I like this uh, crazy style for the, you know, like when a rocket takes off the crazy vibrations. It's kind of interesting that Rick Veitch tried to draw it. Just really uh does it look like Rick Leach? <clears throat> Excuse me. So Bog just drops Kubalov to the ground. He's okay. But then we see the boot of Charles crushing his wrist. So Charles is in Russia to fuck shit up. We see Itchy again. And uh, now we see uh, Doc and Gouda. And, you know, they're, they've been babysitting Larry. And they go into his bedroom and Larry's missing. Because, you know, the, he's off with the one. So they're freaking out. Egypt comes home. She's yelling at him. And right then, the one returns with Larry. He's got these big, goofy sunglasses on. And... Uh, Oh, yeah, I should have mentioned this. Uh, far shucking out is kind of annoying. So to for realis realism's sake, Rick Veitch has some of the characters, you know, cursing in this. But obviously Epic said, no, you can't say fuck. So there's a bunch of shuckins in here. And it's really off-putting. It definitely takes you out of the story. And so he takes him flying some more. And right then, Comrade Bog, riding his missile like a fucking cowboy, <laughs> lands in New York City. And right off the bat, a whole skyscraper falls. I love this two page, the um the beautiful layouts here, this sound effect that swoop, that arc of it, and then these panels emanating from it, and then this intersecting trajectory of the rocket. Just a really good design. This one, too. I like this, the and then you see the building falling. So Comrade Boggs in New York City, and the first thing he does is find some hot dogs and start eating food. Amelia shows up. And they kind of have like a political discussion about capitalism and communism. Meanwhile, the one uh, carries Larry back. He, um, you know, brings Larry back. And the first thing Egypt does is slap him. And uh, Larry recognizes that it's the other, that she's got the other in her. And this is what we, this is so gnarly. She says, I can see him in you now. 
He's the part that turns on me and tries to hurt me, the part that fears me. Well, that's okay, I've had the human touch. So creepy. Almost as creepy as his hair. This, this hair helmet's a little weird looking. And we have another beautiful Puzz Fundles. I don't know if beautiful is the word. <laughs> okay. The one number four. Another great iconic cover. Some good stuff. So Pavlova starts the narration in this issue. Uh, Charles is just raking havoc in, a, I, I believe it's Moscow. All the soldiers who are with Pavlova, they're like, we have to retreat. We have to get the hell out of here. And she's like, no, I want to get closer. Because, you know, she couldn't have Comrade Bog. She got cock blocked on that one. So basically all she cares about is getting with the super being. Look at this crazy lettering. That's humongous. It's some of the biggest lettering I've ever seen in a comic book. So at gunpoint, she tells the soldier to come out to lure Charles over there. <laughs> this is crazy. He's so fast. He just swoops by and rips one arm off. Swoops by him again, rips his other arm off. And then he just crushes his head. So Pavlova basically tries to reason with him. Uh, you know, she's a psychiatrist. She's she's very good at manipulating people. And pretty soon she actually, she starts trying to seduce him. And, uh, you know, he's obviously tempted. This guy's a full grown man who's never had sex in his life. And she's pretty hot. And she tells him that Bog is in America now. And to get inside his to get inside his head, she's like, Oh yeah, you know, your sister this is the first superhuman she's ever met who's not her brother. I wonder what they're doing right now. And Charles is furious. But he's also horny as hell. He rips off her top. And then we cut away. And uh, we hear the story from uh, the president. So I guess um, he basically, like, having sex with a super being has its downside. Because he's so strong. He, like... She he, she got injured by having sex with him, but she liked it. And she, look at the smile on her face. She was just like, oh, that was great. So I guess she's in a rough sex, but with this, it's pretty gnarly. So now uh, we're back in America. Egypt's freaking out because her son has no eyes, but he's definitely like a higher consciousness now. He's talking like the one because he's had the human touch. And he shares the human touch with all of them. And right then, uh, the destruction that Bog has been wreaking, uh, it gets to their building. The building splits in two, practically. And the one shows up, and this part I didn't quite understand. Like, he shows up, but then seems to just disappear. Because these people are kind of in trouble. They're in this crumbling building, and... He doesn't help him or anything. So Gouda's thinking about... She has this very mothering instinct towards Larry. And it's like almost like a dream sequence, but it's not. She's His face crumbles away, and it's the one. Then we see Doc in Egypt. They're trying to make their way down to the street. And on this, you know, the fire escapes practically falling off the building. In fact, it does fall. But they swing down to this uh, awning and make it to the street level. It's not that safe at the street level because there's thousands of people stampeding away from Bog trying to escape his uh, destruction. This is just a sign of like just 
a little example of Rick Veitch's storytelling. I don't know, it's just like so simple. But just them descending to the street level, just, you, you can almost tell that uh, Rick Veitch grew up loving Jack Kirby comics, which he did. Because Jack Kirby was such a good storyteller. Like, no matter what you think of his weird style, you know, it's, everything was so clear and... It was almost like he was a great cinematographer, you know, every camera shot was just where it should be. Close-ups or, you know, long shots. So now we're back in New York City. Bog is fighting Amelia. I kind of like this. He says, die, capitalist stooge. And she says, which stooge is that? Mo. And she pokes him in the eyes. Larry jabs him in the neck. Or Curly Joe. Nyuck, nyuck. I know that's stupid, but I kind of thought that was funny. I thought that was cute. So they're kind of realizing that they're at a stalemate. They're both pretty indestructible. But they're having this epic battle. And Amelia finally realizes, like, oh, he's more indestructible than me. He's a little bit stronger. So she's kind of running away. Meanwhile, Doc is swept away in this crowd. And he's um, separated from Egypt. Bog is chasing Amelia all over the city. And Amelia finally gets one last, you know, her biggest punch, strongest punch. She hopes will take him out. All she does is break her wrist and Bog is fine. And she's injured from all her other injuries. She's just like, she's fucked. So uh, Bog takes this car. I'm sorry, a bus. And wraps it around her and throws her into the East River to die. More musings from Itchy. Now we're back at the North Pole. Charles is on his way back from Russia. And he sees the one again. And the one shows him the magnetic fields emanating from the Earth. And he meets Snurd. And Snurd tells him, uh, oh, oh yeah, I'm sorry. He's explaining the collective unconsciousness to him, the magnetic field. And then when he shakes his hand, Charles's head is full of the truth. Uh, Snurd shows him his real beginnings. Um, he was a test tube baby, him and Amelia. They're not brother and sister. They're test tube babies. And the government raised them to be super soldiers. And they implanted all these false memories in their head so they'd be loyal, patriotic soldiers. So there was no Russian agents. Their parents were never killed by Russian agents. They didn't have parents. And he also, uh, when he touches Charles' hand, he sees Amelia at the bottom of the river. I like this page of just, Amelia, Amelia. It's causing a rupture in the earth, a fissure. And then even halfway across the world, it's uh, causing the giant waves to form. And we see Bog eating more food, getting stronger. And he's saying, I hear you, little stooge. Another Puzz Fundles. I wanted to point out in this one, this is so weird. This logo is so Ditko-like. I would totally think that was a Steve Ditko logo from his weird black and white comics. Once again, more shenanigans with these guys. And now we have the one number five. And another nice fight you cover. So Bog is just ranting to the, to no one in particular, you know, about uh, America's and capitalism's sins. And so it's, it's almost like the superhero weapons are just as bad as nuclear bombs. I mean, this is one punch. Look, three skyscrapers are falling. It's causing a giant rift through the river. 
All these people are trying to escape through the Holland Tunnel or one of the tunnels. And uh, it's just like the end of the world. Egypt's there. And she uh, is witness to Charles diving into the river and pulling out that hunk of metal with Amelia inside. And she's alive. I like how Amelia says, oh, I survived by figuring out how to compress oxygen out of the water with my lips. I mean, to show how superhuman these two, this, these two are. So he tells Amelia about the information he got from Snurd about their whole upbringing. That was all a lie. But the, the good side of this is that they're not brother and sister. And finally, they can, you know, consummate their love. But Amelia says, I have to be sure first. Give me a little. So Charles says, great. You go to the, our, the old farmhouse where we, we supposedly grew up. And I'll go take care of Bog. He's going to kick some red ass. So now uh, the main characters have been given the human touch. They have no eyes. And uh, Doc is talking about the crazy vision he has. And, and he's tripping his brains out. He took some drugs and some booze before getting the human touch. So it's a, a little gnarly for him. And so now we're gonna intersect between uh, Bog, the epic battle between Bog and Charles and Amelia going to find out her origin, her and Charles' origin. I like this, how Bog just spits and it makes a hole in the wall. And I almost think, I don't even know what's going on here, but it seems like Charles, just by flexing, it's like he's, he's growing new muscles almost, and they're making sound effects, like crack shack. <laughs> it's like his, his uh, abdomen is bulging with new muscles. And it looks like uh, Bog is doing the similar type of stuff just flexing to get all this rubble off of him. So uh, back to Amelia at the farmhouse, she sees all these cages. And the cages are all full of full of these mutants. And I love this, how Rick Veitch does this little shout out to the Puzz Fundles. You only see them from behind in silhouette, but those are the same shapes of the Puzz Fundles, guys. It's so funny. Though the scene's not supposed to be funny. More of the epic battle. And so Amelia sees these uh, two people coming towards her. And by their silhouettes, because they're in shadow, it totally looks like her brother and her. But when they come out of the shadow, she sees what they really look like. So they, they were also failed experiments. I kind of like this page how just as they're about to have this amazing punch out, she's yelling no. And just the force of her scream seems to be destroying the, the farmhouse. So it's all at once this amazing just explosion. And look at that. It looks like Manhattan has just torn asunder. Okay, that's the biggest sound effect I've ever seen in the comic. That's crazy. But I guess... Uh, Manhattan being torn asunder is worthy of such a giant special uh, sound effect. So now we see Izzy, basically all these unexpected things. Uh, yeah, he's the richest guy on earth, but pretty soon it's going to be a, it's going to be a pile of rubble. So he's taking the last bit of his money. He's going to buy a space shuttle and just uh, chill out 
in the stratosphere until uh, all this dies down. More great sound effects. Aka doom. Some things get even weirder. So Egypt sees this giant human leviathan, almost like a human centipede, but like thousands of people. And on top of its J-hole, and he's saying, join or die. And Egypt's like, I want to join. Pull me up. Because it's kind of safe being in there in there with all the um, the earth rupturing and fissures just appearing. For some reason, these guys seem to be able to just roll right over it when they're all together. So uh, she says, pull me up. And they're like, fat chance, bitch. You got to start at the bottom. Line forms in the end. And so they're all trying to get closer to the radiant presence of their benevolent master, J-Hole. So J-Hole sees that it's Egypt, so he commands his slaves to bring her to me. So she gets to cut the line, basically. People are pretty pissed off about it. He's like, you're going to be my queen. And she's like, oh, wow, this is great. See, here's a giant fissure, and they're just kind of going over it. So this is basically all the people who didn't get the the big sleep. All the bad people were unaffected by that. They're they're in um because they're the other. And he's explaining what the other is. The other is basically all of our bad side, our bad um our fears, our uh, hatreds. Some cr he just looks so fucking nuts there. And then all of a sudden, the one swoops out of nowhere and grabs Egypt. Brings her to the top of this rickety building. And we can see by his stature, it's it's a little one. Like little Archie, but it's a little one. It's, it's Larry. But even though it's Larry, he's still talking all cosmic, you know, like the one. And she's like, bring me back down there. I want to be the queen. And the one says, he's damned. And if you go with him, so are you. So, you know, they chat for a little while. And Egypt realizes that, uh, that I guess I'd rather be with my baby, her son. But then she just feels hopeless. She just jumps. That's her choice. And the one says, if you truly accept your son, I'm sorry, if you truly love your son, accept this gift from him. The gift of love, pure and unchained. <laughs> He's got eyeballs in his hands. That's a weird image. And another great Puzz Fundles. Okay. Here's the last issue, the one number six. So here we see Izzy. He bought a space shuttle. He's out. He's in outer space. And after all of his machinations, after all of his planning and amazing, brilliant scheming, he forgot to bring cigarettes to the space shuttle. And he's freaking out because he's a total nicotine addict. So now we're back in New York City, this epic battle. I mean, look how gnarly this is. Yeah, and superhero comics guys never got this beat up. You know, they never looked this gross. This comic kind of, this scene kind of reminds me of uh, Scott McCloud's Destroy comic. Also kind of reminds me of um, when Miracle Man fought Bates in those last few issues. Where it's just like every blow they deliver to themselves... The collateral damage is insane. Like built skyscrapers are falling. Thousands of people are dying because of their, you know, their fight. And the whole time they're fighting, they're having a political discussion. But Charles gets the best of him. 
and he takes this like shears off this cliff. It's like the size, size of a mountain, a small mountain and throws it right on top of Bog. And then Amelia shows up. She tells Charles what she saw, realizes that, you know, their past was a lie. And Bog is still alive. He isn't quite dead. And he's just saying, bastards. And Amelia's crying, but also, you know, she's happy because it's like we could be together now. And we realize that Bog wasn't calling them bastards. He's talking about his overlords, the communist rush uh, party. And he starts pounding the earth in his anger. I think that's the only part of his body that can move. So Charles lifts up Amelia and there just happens to be a bed in this all this rubble. And they go to town after all these years. This is some epic lovemaking, probably. We see the president and his uh, cabinet, and the satellite cameras are capturing their lovemaking, and they're watching it, having a great time. They're just like, wow, two super beings having sex. This is some good porn. Bach keeps pounding the earth. So Larry, as the one, is telling... Egypt, his mother, he's like, it's time to choose. You got to choose between the other and the one. And Egypt's falling. And she's like, just save me. And meanwhile, uh, J-Hole is leading the the other Leviathan towards Egypt. He wants to capture her back. So she falls right into the maw of the other And the one tries to talk to J-Hole. He basically tries to convince J-Hole to join the one. Like, you don't have to be on the dark side, the wrong side. God, look at that. So he can't convince J-Hole. And uh, all of a sudden, Egypt turns into another, uh, the one. And as she does, she like explodes out of the Leviathan and like it makes like hundreds of them scatter. And J Hole falls off the top and is left for dead. Now, both of them, like, Egypt can't believe it. She's just like, these glorious love vibrations singing all along the magnetic field. It's basically just this ecstasy of oneness and love. So the magnetic field is drawing everyone to the North Pole. Uh, all these people, everyone's turning into the one, the good people. And they're going into this magnetic field and it's like a river, it's like a current. So Pavlova is now the premier of Russia, now that Kubalov's dead. And uh, she tells us that, you know, all was lost. She was preparing her, um, her what is it called? Uh, her, she was going to sue for peace, her, her articles of surrender to America. And then all of a sudden, by some strange coincidence, maybe because of all the ruckus that woke him up, Ubermaus comes out of the Atlantic Ocean and starts attacking Washington, D.C. The president's furious. He's like, we can't even drop a nuke on it like we used to. We used to have nukes. This thing is just eating up. It's indestructible. It's uh, it's eating up all of Washington, D.C. He figures it's going to be to the White House in like 10, <coughs> in like 10 minutes. So um, he's talking to his cabinet. He's like, okay, guys, I got to bug out to Camp David. You're going to hold down the fort here. God, you know, thank you for your service. And they're just like, fuck. <laughs> this is how weird these guys are. Even though it's like this Uber mouse is about to kill everyone. He's like, let's just watch that tape one more time. That was some hot shit. 
And right then, Charles and Amelia show up to confront him. So they're already kind of mad about the false memory thing. Now they see him looking at uh, a secretly taped sex tape of theirs. So they grab the president, take him out to the lawn, and just throw him into space, right into the spy satellite, and destroys it. Now we see Snurd, and this is why I call him that. Because he's a little pissed off about the way things, all the chips fell. Uh, this uh, acceleration of human evolution wasn't supposed to happen for a long time. But because of man fucking around, bringing us to the brink of ex extinction, the one had to come earlier. He, when um, the original plan was he was supposed to be born a perfectly realized Buddha who got to initiate everybody with tantric sex yoga. But no, the humans hotwired the whole process by trying to commit self-genocide. So he got called to, he got called up too early and ended up looking like Mortimer Snurd. And also the unenlightened primal self was still alive and kicking. So that gave the other lots of, uh, you know, people and energy. And he kind of explains, he's like, yeah, but don't worry. This isn't the first time we've tangoed. So we get the impression that ever since, like, the first fish crawled out of the water, these guys have been in conflict, the one and the other. It's almost like God and Satan, you know. So now we see everyone in the magnetic field, all the one people heading to the North Pole. And there's a giant one who's like a thousand feet tall standing on the North Pole. This is some groovy art here. They're all flowing towards him right into his chest. And they're all becoming one. Meanwhile, in outer space, Itchy's watching all this crazy shit. You know, from space, he can see the one. That's how huge he is. And he can see the magnetic field. Also, he can, he, you can hear the doom. That's how loud that Comrade Bog is punching the ground. <laughs> that is something you can hear all over Earth. It's like a vibration. This is just a beautiful special effect because you know Rick Veitch is great at airbrushing. So all of a sudden, the one takes off into space and he takes the Earth's magnetic field with him. So Itchy really doesn't care. Itchy just wants cigarettes really bad. So he's going to risk flying back to Earth. And then he realizes that, oh, I guess compasses kind of rely on the magnetic field. So his navigation systems are shot to hell. So he totally explodes on reentry. And his last words are, God damn it, all I wanted is a goddamn smoke. Now we see uh, Charles and Amelia making sweet love and Snurd shows up. And uh, he wants to thank them because it wouldn't have worked without them, this, this uh, jump in human evolution. He also uh, wants to thank Bog, even though Bog is far away dying. It's uh, his rhythmic vibrations by punching the earth that allowed the magnetic field to uh, cast off it's mortal coil. It's earthly coil. We see Uber Rats kind of like calm down. It's basically Uber Rats really old. And uh, the the chemicals they put into him kind of mess with his metabolism. So he's pretty, he's not much of a threat anymore. Uh, Snurd tells them that they're like an Adam and Eve in this new world. And you're going to have beautiful super being children. You're going to start a new race of super beings. But the snake in your Garden of Eden is not going to be the super mouse. It's going to be the other. And look at this. It's like a mountain of people. They're all under the influence of the other. And he says, you know, you just have to face it. There's always going to be that evil. It's like yin and yang. you got to have both sides. And then to clear up uh, something else, he shows them these old newspaper articles. Amelia Earhart, lost over Pacific. Lindbergh, baby, feared, kidnapped. Charles Jr. And they're like, Charles, Amelia. So uh, they realize where, who their parents are. 
And uh, we see Comrade Bog finally give up the ghost. And his last words are just like, bastards, rotten, uh, and he dies. I kind of like this hippy-dippy philosophy. I don't believe in any of it. But it's kind of fun to read about it, especially when it's written by a smart guy like Rick Veitch. But he also has like some good uh, social commentary. Like He says basically, uh, he tells the superior beings, he says, don't feel guilty about not saving humanity or not defending your political systems. Both capitalism and communism claimed untold victims in their life. So did feudalism and totalitarianism and all the other isms that people fell into step with. Some things just run out of steam and either have to change or die. It's a fact of life. I mean, it's a very simple philosophy, but it's so true and so many people, you know, <laughs> pretend it's not and uh, fight really hard to keep things the same, even though change is needed. So Snerd runs over to the other mountain and says, hey, wait for me. And because, uh, you know, he's got to be a part of it. He's got to be the yin to the other's yang. And uh, they're going to start this whole whatever cosmic ballet all over again sometime in the future. We see Pavlova's there. And uh, she says, you got to start at the bottom. Look at me. I'm the premier of freaking Russia. And I had to start at the bottom. So you are too. And Snare's just like, okay. <laughs> and he crawls in. It's probably going to take him a long time to get to the top. So now we see uh, our main characters, and they're just talking about how amazing it is. Um, they're basically they're in heaven, even though they're all one with billions of other humans. They also have these idyllic, autonomous lives on this paradise planet, which we see here. I mean, literally, it's the Garden of Eden. They're just running around naked. Everything's perfect. Everyone love is everywhere. Everyone loves everyone else. Even the Beatles have reunited on, in heaven to play a concert for everyone. And Gouda and Doc run off to, to see the concert. And then we have this nice cosmic two-page ending. And uh, talking about the one detaching himself from his planetary cocoon, the newborn took his first shaky steps out into the sp spinning vastness of interstellar space. He allows himself to be carried along like a cork, bobbing on the ebb and flow. And then he simply stopped. A fierce instinct possessed him, not unlike that of a fish being drawn home to spawn. A greater one was calling. Look at that, Peach. That is so great. It's almost like the multiverse. It's like a gallery of all the galaxies and di dimensions. And I guess, you know, implying that, you know, there's this higher being. Once again, I don't believe in any of that gobbledygook. But when Rick, as a part of a science fiction story, it's cool. It's neat, especially Rick Veitch in charge. So that's it for the one. Well, not quite, because we have one more Puzz Fundles. And, uh, yeah, this, they're just having a big party, even though they have no money for rent. This just shows like what an oddball he is. Uh, this little arrow saying chalk tail and it's a martini with a piece of chocolate cake in it. It's just like silly little weird things like that. I know it sounds ridiculous, but you just got to read these. I don't know why. I, I can't really recommend them with any logical reason, but. Oh, man. I like that. So there you have it. The one number one through six. I hope you enjoyed them. Uh, I hope you liked it half as much as I liked rereading them again and making this video. But um, I'm pretty sure Rick Veitch has collected this in a self-published graphic novel. I do suspect, though, it's in black and white. A lot of Rick Veitch's self-published graphic novels are in black and white because he doesn't have the money for color. So these were never that expensive. These were straight to quarter bin all through the 80s and 90s. I think they've died out by now in those cheap bins. But if you can find them, they're definitely worth having in your collection. Just amazing story. Rick Veitch, pretty early on in his career, just busting out of the gate with a amazing storytelling chops. Okay, that's it, I guess. And uh, I'll see you next time here at the Hercules Pedics Academy of Comic Book Studies.